Welcome out, everybody. Today we have a special guest, and his name is Jesse Jesus Hernandez. And I'll let you t I'll let you tell the story, Jesse, here in a second. But I did want to do a little bit of an introduction. Jesse is a freaking rock star. He's out there in the industry saying things that nobody else is saying. And I was inspired and enlightened the last time I jumped on LinkedIn. I heard. Probably a 15-second blip from one of his uh, presentations that he did recently. I don't even know where it was, but it hit me so hard and was the reason why I left the field and wanted to even leave the entire industry. And it touched me so much of what he was saying that I had to invite him out today to have him share his story. <laughs> Jesse Hernandez, uh, one of my really close friends and confidants in the construction industry. What's going on, Mr. Spencer, and all the folks out there in the Omniverse? Um, yeah, I, I love that you said both names because that's uh, uh, my mom, the story around that. Like, my name, my real name's Jesus. That's what it is on my birth certificate. And I was speaking at a parent summit years ago, and I invited my mom to finally show her that I'm doing good guy things. Uh, and I got a lot of, you know, it was good. People responded very well. Afterwards, her only comment to me was, your name's not Jesse. Your name's Jesus. <laughs> is the way they introduced me. I said, yes, ma'am. Uh, but everybody knows me as Jesse. Some people know me as Chewy. All of the above will work. Um, and, and, you know, that, that uh, the clip that you talked about, we were in Vegas. Jennifer Lacey and I were in Vegas at the AGC National Conference, and we got selected to present. Uh, and, and I think the name of the presentation was People Before Tools, Culture Before Rules, right? And you talked on, you know, saying some of the things that aren't being said. Um, I, I really feel like people feel the things. We just don't know how to get the words out. And, and because the words are very... Um, centric to how I feel or how we feel. And so sharing that puts us at risk, right? That's the vulnerability element of it. Uh, and so I was talking, that little clip talked about back in the day when I was a foreman, I was a plumbing foreman. And the only time my phone rang was for people to tell me how poorly I was doing at my job. And what I mean by that, it wasn't just the general contractor. It was my project man, my project manager telling me how much I suck. It was my team that I was supporting, planning, serving, telling me how much I suck. It was the office telling me like it was it was my my wife or significant other telling me how much I suck because I'm not coming home on time or because I'm canceling another vacation or dinner or whatever. And I know that that's not a a localized event right that's a situation that i think all of our i know all of our foremen experience that and that's not to say that project managers and superintendents don't experience the same thing um, i just haven't lived that life I, i've come through the trade side of the business before i got into consulting and speaking and all and writing all the stuff you know i was uh, 1995 i graduated high school got into plumbing and, you know, the first real the first time I realized, like, something's wrong was when I got promoted to foreman. It was like somebody quit or they oversold themselves in terms of backlog and they needed somebody else to run another job that started earlier than they uh, planned on. And I was a pretty good installer. So they said, hey, Jesse, <laughs> you you're a pretty good installer. Why don't you go be a foreman on this job? I was not prepared. And so I've seen this over and over through the last two jobs I've had is seeing very talented installers be put in a position to lead crews without being given the tools to plan and lead a project. And what I mean by lead, they they are influential. And that's a really, really important factor. But understanding the systems and the processes, the financial reports, estimates, et cetera, 
and being able to translate that into an actionable plan, that's not out there. There's very few organizations that teach their people how to do that. And it's a, another observation, traveling the country, supporting project teams, one of the big differentiators I've been able to see in, in trades is like the best in class trades in terms of performance. The, diff, the one consistent differentiator was they have a production planning system, whatever it is, like it's not a fancy one. Uh, it's just they have a way that they teach their foreman and field superintendents on how to plan in alignment with the budget. There's no magic silver bullet that teaches a trade how to plan in alignment with whatever the hell the GC's thinking. <laughs> That's a whole different story, right? And there's systems out there that are helping mitigate that. And we have a long way to go there. But anyways, when I got promoted to foreman level, what I noticed was it sucked. And I was working really, really hard to, to just learn how to do the damn job. And my phone rang. It was the GC. You're behind. You don't have enough people. You need more material. You need to move your material. Whoa. My project manager, we got a meeting on Friday. I need, the, I need your updates. I need this. I need that. And why aren't you getting it done? What's wrong with you? Don't you know how to manage your time? It was my team. Like, oh, where's our material? I thought you said we, were gonna be, we weren't going to be working Saturday. And now you're calling me at the last minute. Like, these were. this was every day. And I also didn't really know how to do the damn job. We had a monthly meeting every month, job reviews, right? We'd come in and we would look at the financial labor forecast, financial forecast, and everybody in the meeting, they were like bosses, right? <laughs> General managers, business unit managers, ops managers, senior people, like all the fancy people. And all they could tell me was that my performance wasn't good enough. None of them could help me get better. <laughs> like. Imagine that state, Spencer. I mean, is that similar to what you experienced? 100%. That's why I no longer was in the field. I was like, I'm going to go. And I didn't even want to go like to the office. I wanted to leave the industry. I was like, construction sucks. I'm out. So just like I felt maybe not in the exact same way, but I felt the same things like exactly. And I think that's I think that's everybody. I think everybody feels that. Yes, I, I agree 100%. I'm going to go off a little tangent. I'll come back. You know, and I think it's we don't really understand how to cultivate the skills for construction leadership. And again, when I, maybe I should say more, more clearly for construction managing. Because <laughs> leadership, there's a, for me in my head, there's an element of influence in developing people's capabilities. If you're not doing that, if I'm not doing that, I'm not a leader. But if I can manage timesheets and fill out all this, the paperwork and do all the stuff, I'm a good manager, right? When I start developing people and people around me start growing, I have now graduated into leadership. That's the way I see it. And the like the career progress, project, progression is get good at managing and doing things. And then all of a sudden there's this magic line that we jump over to also managing and supporting people. And what we do is we start managing and supporting people as if they're things. Uh -huh. And I've seen that. <laughs> what do you think about that? <laughs> that? That is really well said. That is really well said. Goes and goes and goes and goes. And, you know, we talked about mental wellness you know, substance abuse, um, that's my story, right? Uh, addiction, that's my story. Because I didn't know how to cope with it. And all mm -hmm. I knew how to do was work harder, work more time, work more hours. Now, I remember I was talking to the HR manager at the time, and, and we had a decent relationship. Man, this was 25 years ago when she was like, Jess, like, why do you, what do you think? Why are we losing so many foremen? Like, do people just not want... Here's an interesting thing. It's like, do people just not want to be better? Like, do they not want more for themselves? <laughs> and I'm like, I don't think that's what it is. It's misery, right? It yeah. sucks. Yeah. Nobody's going to tell you how to do good. Nobody's going to help you build the skills that you need. You might get lucky and work with somebody 
that coincidentally is developing you and supporting you. But that's rare. It's like we want these we want people to promote and, and aspire to be foreman or be field in field leadership, but we don't give them the tools and the knowledge or the thinking set to be successful at it. But man, are we ready? We got all kinds of metrics to point to to let them know how poorly they're doing. It's like so it and and it's compounded because we haven't equipped the field leaders to do the freaking job which makes us lose money, which makes us lose time, which amplifies our stress. When I say our, I'm going to talk I'm talking about like the senior leadership amplifies their stress. And the only thing they know how to do is put that stress back on the damn foreman. So why would anybody want to do it? Like there's just no, there's just no escape. Um, and again, I got yeah, self-medicated. That's what I did. That's how I dealt with things. Um, so that was like the earliest inkling of like, this this is broken. This doesn't work. And that motivated me to put together some training, uh, transitional training, right? Because I went from installer to foreman and I sucked. And then I think, you know, a couple of years and I got really good at it. And then I got promoted again. I got given a laptop and keys to a truck. And I said, go be a superintendent. I said, what is, what's a superintendent? Like, I intend to do super things. Like, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> and so I sucked again. And then I figured it out after a couple of years because I'm also ravenous in terms of wanting to understand how everything's connected. If you keep bashing me over the head with this budget and the estimate, I want to understand every nook and cranny of the budget and the estimate. So I got into studying it and then I was able to see like, oh, there's a connection here. But I knew the connection because I'd lived the pain. And then I said, okay, well, what if we, what if I do some training to help introduce, like translate the language that, but that these leaders were speaking <laughs> and judging me on, but never helping. And the truth is like, they don't know how to help me. They just, they don't even realize that we need help and it's their responsibility. Right? So anyways, put training together. Uh, and to help people transition from installer to foreman, from foreman to superintendent. And, and then the question again was like, well, there's still not a lot of people signing up for it. Do they just not want more for themselves? And that's where like another realization came from. You know, it's very easy, uh, you know, when we can't take the time to understand, all we can do is judge. And so when people, when trade professionals aren't, stepping up being a team player it's easy to judge them and say they don't want more for themselves but like fernando who is who is the case study for my podcast the learnings and missteps podcast i judged him i'm like bro like why don't you want to step up like man you got the skill duh, duh, duh. i'm going to help you i'm going to support you and finally he's like jesse i don't have the time for it me and my wife adopted my uh, family members children so we're raising their children here he was whatever in his 40s raising a brand new set of kids i'm like oh wow that's pretty damn amazing he's i'm a, i'm part of this motorcycle group and what we do is all year we have fan drives we have toy drives we have bike drives we do a lot to provide this part of our community the west side of san antonio uh, with stuff that they don't really have and i mean really box fans we're not talking about split system air conditioning units we're talking about box fans for people's homes because that's the only cooling that they have and then i'm like oh my god you're doing so yeah we can't get in the way of the way you're serving the community but i never bothered to understand him and so there's this weird thinking that people are in the trades because they don't want more for themselves or they're not jumping up and down because they don't want more for themselves but the reality is when you get in those positions What's the more that we're actually talking about? Because in most cases, the more is more butt chewings. I, 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 you know, maybe a little bit of influence, maybe a little bit more money, but is the money worth it at the expense of my health, right? At the expense of my self-esteem? It's really not. I mean, it, it's, and I know there's a lot of folks out there. They're like, why are you whining? If you don't like it, get out of it. I get it. I, I 
70% agree because that's my mindset, right? Suck it up, get the damn thing done. But the other 30% is really important because the, the leadership, the folks that are out there that, that have the influence and the authority to make things better are failing to do so. They're allowing it to be worse, right? And so now I'm a tradesperson. I have some pride in my work. I want to accomplish things. I have a career. I have a family to support, blah, blah, blah. And I come to your job that you cannot do without me. I'll say it again. You cannot do without me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you're going to treat me like I'm the problem? You know, my, my favorite one is when I show up and first day on and they're like, Jess, we're behind schedule. You got to make up two weeks. And I'm looking at their fancy schedule like, no, no, I'm here on time. Like, this is when I was supposed to be here. You told me not to come because you weren't ready. I'm starting here because of you. So how do I have to make that up? And then that starts the, the, the ball rolling, right? Sure, I could have taken a different tone. But the reality is, or maybe, what would it look like if we shifted our thinking from treating the trades as the problem to supporting them and capacitating them as the solution? Because you're not going to get done without them. And I don't think people recognize that. You know, you know, there was there was there was a group that I was helping when I was doing more consulting. I'm more of an internal consultant now, but, uh, I went to a group and I thought that everyone was on the same page with this. Cause like when you, like everything you just said, I was like, amen. That's that it. That's it. Um, I, I started talking to them about respect and this was a GC, right? And, um, I mentioned, you know, the thing that, that we're lacking a lot is respect. And so, whether it's pull planning or any of these systems, it's trying to include people. It's trying to give more respect. So that's why these systems and tools usually give us a better outcome because it's a more respectful approach. And I was met with something that flabbergasted me. I didn't even know what to say. It's the first time like I couldn't come up with something to say. And the superintendent looked at me and said, uh, the number one thing we should not be doing is respecting the workers and i was like excuse me is like yeah without us telling them what to do they won't they don't show up and and do their job like and i was i was like so you're saying we shouldn't respect them we need to treat them poorly in order to get what we want and i said that and he said that's exactly right and i was i i sat there and i was i was and I looked around the room being like, okay, so who's a, who's another sane person here that I could like start talking to? And they all were sitting there like, yeah, we understand what he's saying. And I was like, I don't think I can move forward in this relationship because we're not even in the same planet. Like, I don't even understand what you're talking about. Um, but that seems to be the reality. One thing that came to mind when you were talking was um, you were describing a horrible situation. And do you think that the people out that aren't foreman yet, the the carpenters, the plumbers, the journeyman installers, do you think that they don't see how the foremen are treated? Do you think that they don't see how the office treats the foreman? You don't think that they see those things? I saw that and I thought naively, oh, I'm going to get there and I'm going to be able to change that. No, nope. <laughs> that was not the case. And everyone can see that meat grinder that, uh, like on Princess Bride, it's the pit of despair. Who wants to sign up for the freaking pit of despair? No one wants to sign up for the pit of despair. But everyone on their high horses wants to say, well, why, 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 don't, why don't more people want to take that career path? Why don't people want to grow? It's like, well, they don't see it as growth. They see jumping into a meat grinder. They see jumping into the pit of despair. That's what they, That's what we all see, right? We can see that that's what it is. So I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. There's a couple things there with the, what are the journeymen see? Cause there were some, uh, what's the word? Compromises I had to make as a foreman 
and as a superintendent that Chewy would call me a sellout for. And I absolutely felt like a sellout. But given the information at hand, it was the, the best compromise I could make. And so, you know, I remember being an installer and say, man, I, I can't wait till I'm a foreman because all they do is sit in the office and eat tacos all the time. And I can't wait till I'm a superintendent because all they do is drive around. So there is that naivety that like, that's not the damn truth. I wish it was. Um, but you're right. Like they see you getting yelled at. You got to go to meetings. You got you got all these responsibilities. You got to deal with people, their personal issues, time and like it's a lot. Right. And it is, there's very little that is attractive about it. You know, most of the people I know that were like ambitious and really wanted to be a foreman or be a superintendent, what they wanted was the status. Mm -hmm. They didn't understand the sacrifice that was necessary to be uh, excellent at those, at those levels. Uh, and again, so I think organizations do a poor job and this is in any organ, like not even just construction, like, I got to a point where I had to really evaluate what am I signaling to people that I value? And early on, like early on when I was first foreman, what I really valued was compliance. And that's mm. not the best mm. thing to value because if people didn't argue with me, they were on my crew. The people that did, they got sifted out. Eventually I was surrounded by bobbleheads because all I valued was compliance. Right. And we'd be right. running off, no, running off the hill with nobody to say, hey, Jess, this is stupid. So if I operate like that and my boss operates like that and her boss operates like that, like we're in a vicious cycle, right? It's going to be bad. And so understanding what what I value or what the leaders value can really impact that perception of what being a foreman or being a superintendent is, right? When we're ultra clear about what those expectations are. So one example, uh, when I started that training, uh, we people that were in the foreman role, we said, okay, you're in the foreman role and we're gonna put you this training so you can learn, we, like we functioned off of last planner system back then, whether mm -hmm. the GC did it or not. So I had to introduce them to all of those pieces and then how to understand the estimate and translate that into like, cause I, my favorite thing is when our project manager like, you're running out of hours. <laughs> what percentage of hours have you used? And they would get frustrated. Like, Jesse, your guys aren't learning anything. Like, yeah, they are. You're asking the wrong question. Like, we don't install hours. We install pipe. We install duct. We install hangers. So we need to translate the hours to these units of installation because that's the language that our field speaks. Well, that's the value, too. Like, you're installing what... The value isn't the time that's spent. The value is the the thing that's getting installed. It's pr it's pr it's production. It's productivity. It's not hours and time and and cost. the The installation of the thing costs. The installation of the thing takes time. But you don't manage the time. You should be managing the production, right? You got it. You we're you, we're on the same page. So <laughs> right. we put everybody right. through the foreman training, and I remember it was Kelly James, pipe fitter welder, solid guy. I mean, the dude could do magic. And he asked me straight up. He's like, Jess, like, do we have to do this paperwork, right? Because now I was requiring them to do weekly work plans and six week, like all this stuff, right? And I said yes. And he says, what if we don't want to do that? And I never expected the question, but my my instinctual response was, well, then you you don't have to do that. Foreman do. And then his next question was, will I get fired if I don't if I choose not to do that? I said, hell no, we still need you, Kelly. Like, no, you won't get fired. But just know that to be a foreman and access whatever that act provides. These are the expectations and the requirements, and we're going to coach you through getting good at them. And he said, man, I appreciate it. I, I, I'm not going to, I don't want to do that. It's like, okay, cool. Because we still needed them out there installing. And I had right. one, one of the superintendents were like, Jess, why are you being soft on them? We should have written them up and suspended. I was like, and replace him with who? Like everybody wants Kelly on their project and we're going to go and cut him because he doesn't want to be a foreman. 
do you want to be a foreman? <laughs> right? Like, come on, bro. So that's one. That, I think that's, that's important that we recognize that we need installers, too. And if they yeah. don't want to be a foreman, yeah. awesome. Get the weirdos like me, like us, that want to do more and impact and influence more and invest in them. And, you know, you're talking about the group that that was living in a different planet. And and I want to say, like, their reality is true. What they don't know is that they've created it. Yeah. And what yeah. I mean yeah. by that is yeah. they believe, like, 100% to their bones, you have to tell trades what the hell to do because they can't make a decision. They don't know any better. They do it, right? All of these things. What they can't see is they've created that situation, right? And a, a lot of managers do this. I used to do it, and I still do it sometimes. I try to break the habit where if every time somebody comes to me with a situation, I give them the answer. They come back again, and I give them the answer. I give them the answer. All of a sudden, what happens is they don't have to do any critical thinking because I'm the answer God. And my idea is no value. So let me turn that off too. And so now I'm just waiting for you to call me and tell me what to do. So yeah, you have to tell me what to do. What they're not aware of is that their default response is to solutionize and provide the damn answer. And that is a hard thing to become aware of and it creates that you've heard of what is the Pygmalion, Pygmalion effect, right? What I believe about somebody, they will most likely become. So then they're in this cycle and they can't get out of it because it becomes a reality. And why does the rest of the team agree with them? Because that's how he treats the rest of the team. And it's true. Right. Right. It's going to take a gigantic shift for them to break that and even become aware of how miserable we are at actually listening to people. Whereas somebody brings me a problem, I don't want to take their problem. I want them to keep the problem and I want to support them, right? So you bring me a problem, I'm gonna say, okay, well, what have you tried? What are you thinking of trying? Which one seems like it's gonna hurt the least? How about you try that and let me know how it goes? At that point, I didn't, take anything from you you i helped supported the critical thinking and now you have awareness of your own agency to make decisions so that i don't have i'm no longer dependent or handicapped by the answer giver the solutionizer but how do we get there right how do we get people to that thing um, is really the big question. And what, that's one of the biggest questions that I'm experimenting on attacking and, and helping people realize there's another way to do it. And the things that I'm most frustrated with are my fault. <laughs> that's so interesting. And so spot on. It's so spot on. So uh, tell me more. Tell me more about that. Uh, you said that's the thing you're experimenting with. Like where and how are you experimenting with those things? I'm not sure if you've heard me talk about emotional bungee jumpers at all. That's what that is, right? The name, I, you know, I've gotten some good counsel on on the name because it freaks people out because the word emotional is in it. Um, and then bungee jumpers right after it. <laughs> Two things that people are very, very anxiety driven about, right? A hundred percent. And the reason I decided to call it that is because that's what people tell me it feels like, right? And so it's it's a simple exercise. There's a bunch of different elements, right? We have a social community. We got a monthly call. You get journals. There's challenges. There's all kinds of stuff. But the awareness, there's two points of awareness. So every month we have a monthly challenge. And this is to help grow your awareness and, like, help the people around you notice like hey that dude's behaving a little different and so last month's uh last month's challenge was for people to go and ask at least three people what's your preferred method of communication meaning do you like text do you like email do you like phone calls do you like whatever video calls um and what was awesome is people came back and said man i did that and i was surprised like 
there's a group of people that I've been communicating with through Slack and they don't like Slack. <laughs> and now I understand why we're missing because that's not their preferred method of communication. That sounds, that's a, like, that's one of the easy, easy ones. <laughs> right. There's some other tougher right. ones, but that helps them think diff like, oh, damn, there's a lot of assumptions that I'm operating on. So that's one of the monthly challenges. On the calls, the monthly calls, we run an exercise where you have a problem owner, a coach, an observer, and the audience. Problem owner, your job is to bring a problem. Personal, professional, it doesn't matter. That's where the vulnerability and the bungee jumping is happening, right? Because now I have to audibly say, I have a problem, which most of us struggle with admitting that I have a problem. There's been several people that are like, I don't have a problem. Like, oh, we got some work to do with you. Um, and we usually start off kind of light, right? Like, well, you know, traffic or something silly. And it's fine. It's, everything's fair game. The coach's job is to listen and ask interested questions, which means no solutionizing, no giving advice, no closed-ended questions, no leading questions, which sounds easy. But when you're in the middle of it, you discover how that's your only way of interacting with people. And then to add on that, we have the observer. The observer's job is to write down all the violations that the coach made. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and there's some more emotional bungee jumping happening there because once they go through this cycle, the nine minutes, the coach and the observer have this dialogue. And the and the coach sometimes it's awesome. Sometimes the coach is like, I, I just don't know how to do this without violating. So I'm just gonna do it. It's like good, do it. We're just trying to build your awareness. You're not gonna get a pass or fail. The lean police aren't gonna come get you. Um, then the observer, we give them a few minutes to provide their feedback and observations of the violations and also great questions that the coach asked. And so, so there's a jumping part there because now you got to give direct and honest feedback which we're also terrible at. We're not as good at it as we think we are. <laughs> and so people will pat it up and massage it and dance around before they actually give the feedback. And, and the audience gets to share their observations of the whole thing. So we're all kind of learning these little meta skills of how we actually function and and we get reps every month. We do this. And so we get rep after rep after rep to improve upon the way we listen, the way we give feedback, the way we receive feedback, our vulnerability in sharing problems with people that we start building trust with. Um, so again, it's an online community, but that's the experiment that I was referring to. And it started last year and I picked Jen, Adam, Sean, Kirby, because I felt like they they trusted me enough to do another crazy wild thing and it, it's impacted their lives. So it's like, okay, now we need to open this up uh, and we're slowly but steadily growing that community. That's amazing. Um, have you seen Kung Fu Panda 3? I have not, not part three. I've seen one and two. I didn't even know there was a three. <laughs> So I didn't know there was a three either. My my second oldest daughter just is into pandas. So we started watching Kung Fu Panda. And Master Ugwe, who's the turtle in number one, he comes back in number three. Um, and Ugwe has a lot of good good quotes that uh, we could share. But there's, there's one quote from Kung Fu Panda 3, because I watched it last night with my kids, that came to mind as you, as you were talking. Um, and it's, it's centered around the coach because you were talking about no solutionizing, no telling, like you don't have this, oh, follow this one path. Like, you know, you might have followed the path that you know, and you're saying, just follow my footsteps and you'll get there, right? That's the leading question. That's probably the hardest one is you can see where someone's struggling. It's like, oh, I've been there. Just follow my steps and it, it like, it, it'll solve it for you, right? Um, that's so, that's so easy to do and hard not to do as a coach. And I agree with you that good coaches don't give prescriptions. I think we they focus more on people and values. Now the Kung Fu Panda 
three uh, thing. Master Shifu, who's who's uh, the the panda's teacher. Um, you know, when the panda becomes the you know kind of a master of kung fu, the dragon warrior, as they call it in the movie. Uh, um, he reaches that he reaches that step. Let's say it's the installer reaching like you know that there like was it Kelly or whatever you said the guy's name was that was like the the guy that everybody wants on the job. Like he has reached a master level. He is a he is a master installer, right? Um, well, to reach the next step is to become teacher, right? And Shifu tells him, well, you're going to you're going to teach the, the five who already know how they know Kung Fu probably better than the Dragon Warrior the the panda does. Right. And he fails at it. And uh, Shifu says, yeah, I, I knew you were going to fail. And he was like, well, then why did you have me do it? Why don't you just do it? And he's like, I'm not trying to turn you into me. I'm trying to turn you into you. And I was like, oh, that's freaking good. That's freaking good. You should watch Kung Fu Panda 3. There's so many good, like, similarities between, like, what we've been talking about in the Kung Fu Panda series. It's really good. <laughs> but anyway, that's what came to mind. Yes, that is absolutely it, right? It's it's about, for me, like, what drives me, what, what rather... What am I addicted to? Like the most, the healthiest addiction I have. <laughs> we'll say it that way. Yeah. And it's being yeah. present when people are walking through self-discovery. Mm. When they find their way or they start letting their voice out more than they used to or sharing their ideas more than they ever planned to. Being present to experience that is it's the ultimate for me and that's 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 kind of why the emotional bungee jumpers became like a community thing because we have the lean and love book right that's awesome and i get feedback like hey you know my friend read the book and it was helpful and and i realized i'm like that's awesome but i was a little salty about it and i was like why am i salty like that that was the point well it was because i couldn't see it like I heard about it after the fact, like I wasn't present to see the impact. And so ah. selfishly, ah. that's part of the reason for the community is because I'm there to see the lights come on or the takeaways that are like, oh, baby, that's a big deal. Um, it, it's, it's like the ultimate shot of fulfillment live when we're doing the things. And I mean, that those that, those are some of the greatest gifts that I ever received was becoming aware of what I could be, uh, becoming aware that all those little whispers that I could see in the periphery of my mind, that those weren't lies. Those were truths that I haven't embraced yet. And people helped me get there. And so for me, it's like, okay, how do I help other people? How do I serve in that manner such that people take that first step? Going from zero right. to one, just do the one right. thing, and then then it's off to the races, baby. I love that. I love that. So so remind everybody once again, how often do you meet? Um, where can they where can they find the emo the emotional bungee jumping? If someone's interested, where would they go? Y yeah. So go? we meet. We have. We just opened up a second group because it grew faster than I expected. And the second group right now is meeting on the second Friday of the month at 2 p.m. Central. They're like an hour, an hour and 45 minutes are, is the duration of the call. Um, like I said, every second Friday of the week, that's for group two. We also learned on the first group that there's, there's, there's a certain volume, like number of people where we stop, we start losing the connectivity and the like the intimacy of it. Right. And so we're capping it off. Like so, right. the group will cap off at eighteen, and then we'll figure out if we can fit. When I say we, Jennifer, Lacey, and I, uh, when we could fit a third one if it gets to that. Uh, but anyways, to so to find it, go to Depth Builder, my website, depthbuilder.com forward slash services. And you'll see emotional bungee jumpers is right there at the top and you can click and, you know, check it out. There's a video there even if you want to see like what it looks like. We did a, a live demonstration of it because people are like, what the hell are you talking about? What is this thing? I was like, well, I, it's going to take me 10 hours to explain it. Watch the video. And then if, if 
you'll know like do you want to play or not and some people i've invited to to like be an auditor and like be present and watch and afterwards you're like there ain't no way i'm doing that jess like i think it's phenomenal but i'm not ready for that I'm like fair <laughs> enough i get it but it is it is quite um you know it's an exercise in vulnerability for sure 100 percent. i'll i'll put the links and everything in in the description down below uh in the video and share it as as much as i can i might even put it like across the screen so that that people can can look it up if interested so is there anything else that you've been working on recently uh or anything else um that's cutting edge that you that you want to uh kind of showcase or highlight yeah no not really but i'm gonna because i'm supposed to um so i have this magic special early release thing in my hand can you see that <laughs> i can that looks so cool that's awesome so that is my second first book so tell tell us why why do you call it your second first book i've heard you say that why is it your second first book well two reasons uh the first like the the wishy-washy reason is because i said it one time it just came out like if you've seen the no bs with jen and jess live streams i'll say things <laughs> and i don't know i don't ever really remember what i say but when i go back and watch them i'm like what the hell did, where did that come from so that was one like that i was like oh that was interesting and then people responded to it like oh second first book whatever what is that i'm like oh that's an intention grabber like okay i like that i'll keep saying it that's one thing but the real truth is I started writing this book back in January of 21. Mm. And mm. right, so I was still working full time. And so it was going very, very slow, but I was working on it. And along that path, we started having the 5S, uh, 5S in relationships live streams, right? You were, you were on one of the, you actually rocked the house on that final, uh, extravaganza to that uh, and so when we started having the live streams the outcome was like oh my god there's something bigger here because we were talking about relationships and the human side of business and all these squishy things that we don't really talk about and people like major firms representatives of like the largest builders in the country and other builders were all present and we're all interested in talking about these these things, these real human experiences. And it's like, whoa, I think we've tapped into something that's bigger than we expected. So those conversations kept going. And then Kirby asked me, Kirby Coates asked, she's like, hey, like, I wish there was a way I could get a summary of the high points and some of the cheat codes that the people shared in the comments. So I didn't have to go and watch nine hours of video. And I haphazard, I was like, oh, well, I got them all transcribed, right? Because when I would cut clips and stuff, I dump it into script and it, it transcribes everything for me. And I sat there and read for about five minutes and I said, okay, I'm not going to read all this. <laughs> like, I know, I, I, hey, Kirby, I'm going to break my promise because I'm not going to read through everything. And then I said, wait a minute, I'm working on this other book. Let me call Kim and share this idea. And so I said, hey, I have an idea. We have, you know, about nine hours of transcribed content and we turn that into a book. And she said, yes, actually, that'll be easier. And I said, OK, so we started down that path, which meant I had to pause the this book because I, we needed to work on the other one. That's why I call it my second first book. And, and maybe there's an undertone of, you know, Jennifer Lacey and I co-authored that book and really the community right because there's a lot of great insight that people shared that we included in the book um and so that one's kind of a community book and this one's like just me book so right. multiple reasons i call it the second first book that's beautiful so what is the second first book about it's um it's about me and so it's the title of the book is becoming the promise you are intended to be mm. and and that this is a story uh, there's 20 stories that i experienced throughout my life back from when i was a little kid to maybe here the last year or two that impacted me like the lessons i had from those experiences 
have become the the framework for my thinking and my or my operating system right it, it's it's where my decision making my outlook all of the things come from or came from um and you know i think it happened perfectly because the first when i when we finished the lean in love uh book I said, okay, now I got to go back and pick up where I left off on the other book. And I started reading it. And I was like, man, what is this wishy-washy garbage? Like, I was like, did I really write that? And yes, I did. <laughs> but the difference was when I wrote that, my level with vulnerability, rather my comfort with vulnerability was very, very low. Um, or lower, relatively speaking. And my awareness of people's appreciation of my vulnerability was also hyper low. And so when I read the book, I had this preconceived outcome that I wanted to frame it kind of like uh, the five dysfunctions of a team and essentialism. And, and like it had that, that was my thinking around it. And when I read it, I was like, man, this is weak sauce. Like you ever get hot sauce and they tell you it's the hottest hot sauce and it ain't hot. That's what it felt like when I read it. <laughs> I was like, okay, this isn't good. I'm going to, I, I, it's not what I want to do. And and so starting over was not a fun idea because there was a lot of time that I had spent. And a friend of mine, Donna, she was like, hey, I, I recorded my book, Speech to Text. And I was like, oh, that's a great idea. And so I had all these stories and what stories, which ones were like the, the ones that moved me the most, blah, blah, blah. And so I just started recording them while I was driving, while I was running, walking, whatever. I would just tell the story of what it was. My thinking was I'll tell these stories and then I'll, you know, peek, peel them apart and make, you know, whatever. Well, as I was working through the stories, I'm like, this story lives all by itself all right, let me do the next one. Again, like it lives all by itself. So there's no, so I just decided, I was like, you know what? It's just going to be 20 stories. <laughs> and so I just finished recording the audio book and there's about four or five stories in there that I still can't read without crying. Like you can hear me choking up and my, my voice breaking off. And the interesting thing is it's not a cry it's not so much a cry of like uh, frustration or, or anger or any of that or resentment. There's no resentment in the tears. It's more tears of triumph, tears of I remember what that felt like and what other people feel like that are in the same situation. Um, there may be tears of triumph and empathy and I can't hold them back. Like every time you when I'm real, like, oh, like it, it takes me back to that. And also helps me realize, like, man, that's where I was. And, and, and I'm living proof that we can get beyond it. Um, and the title came from one of my, my therapists when I was in rehab. He called me out. He's like, Jess, you know how to play the game and manipul manipulate your way through all of this. He's like, but your problem is you haven't accepted. And I said, accepted what? He's like, you haven't accepted that you will never become the promise you are intended to be if you continue to live life the way you're living it. And that, it was a lightning bolt, man. And I think that is true for many of us. And, and that's the purpose of the book, to help people become the promise they're intended to be. So talk more to that. That was extremely powerful. And thank you for sharing such an intimate moment that that's hard to do. That's hard, especially about something like in the industry. I don't know, 10 years ago, even a couple years ago, talking about being in therapy like that would have been like, a, oh, you know, I think we all need therapy. I'm currently in therapy. We we I think I think that's almost as important as insurance. It's almost as important as water. Like we need, we need help. We do need help. And I think those skills are important, but talk more about the, the promise. What, 
What does that mean? Like the promise that we're intent, like the promise, what, what promise? Where does like, talk to me about that. So when he said that to me, Ooh, baby, the first thing I thought of was my mom holding me when I was born and the future that she dreamed of for me and the promise that she wanted me to be to the world. That was the first idea, thought that came to my head. And I think all of us, whether we're aware of it or not, when we came into this world, the people that we've interacted with as we've grown and developed through school, elementary school, kindergarten, people see promise in us. And some of us fulfill it, some of us don't. Some of us fulfill degrees of it, some of us don't. Um, that was the first thought, like the first wave of, of, we'll just say awareness, not awareness, we'll say mind shift. The first mind shift that happened was that like, oh shit, that, yeah, I know what you're talking about. And then the next wave was, you know, there were times there, and still now there's times when I've done things that do not represent me well. And there's times when I've done wicked, wicked things. And I know the disgust I feel for me, within me, for doing those things. And when that happens, there's a feeling of loss. And so that feeling of loss is me losing my way to being that promise that everybody else sees within me that promise that my mom saw when she held me when I was a little, little baby. And then another wave hit me, you know, there's times where I watch a movie, um, Kung Fu Panda, Kung Fu Hustle actually is one that's impacted me a lot, which is weird because that movie makes me cry too. <laughs> and it's not, a, it, it's not a drama, right? Um, but there's, I watch movies or I'll hear a story or I'll see something where people are doing heroic, heroic things and they overcome major, major tragedies that, that break people in half and they work through it. And what I feel within me is that I can do that too. I feel that's what I want to be for me and that's what I want to be for other people. That's the promise. So when he said all of that, become the promise you're intended to be, it's all of that. And the key was not living life the way I was living it. It wasn't stop drinking, stop womanizing. It wasn't that. It was stop living life the way I was living it. And to your point, you were talking about um, we all should be in therapy. So, yes. and. The question is, how was I living life? I was living life closed off, solitary, guarded. Uh, nobody was allowed near me. Nobody was welcome to get within my feelings and my thoughts. And because of that, I could not grow. I could not serve in the manner that I'm designed to best serve others. So I had to learn how to let people in. I had to learn how to be vulnerable and and be okay that people are gonna judge me people their haters are gonna hate right like that's what they do and that's okay but that one person when i open up and and signal to that person that i see them and i'm here i'm present i understand i can impact people's lives and introducing people to the promise they're intended to be is me becoming the promise. I love that. It's, it's, uh, it is a natural progression, right? You just, you just described something of, you know, the promise from your mother's point of view, from close friends and family members point of view, it's outward to inward, right? We're getting that from outward inward, but I think there is a switch in everything where you're getting your value from outside versus getting your value from inside. It's how you see yourself, how your expectation for you 
um, the loss of, I didn't hit the mark for me, not that I didn't hit the mark for somebody else. It's that promise is intrinsic now. It's me, right? And that, that, that takes, that takes wisdom and, and for a lot of people, it takes time, right? And that's why we like you think of wisdom, wisdom in like the, the elder folks, but it's it's not really old people. It's it's wisdom. It's being wise and you can be wise beyond your years for sure. But that is beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that. Thank you, man. Thank you for the questions. <laughs> so um, one last time, um, if you could leave um, one thought with people. If you could, if you could, in, if you could do one thing to inspire folks in the construction industry or outside, um, what would be the one thing that you would want to leave for people? The one thing I would want to leave for people is peace within them, knowing or accepting that they are enough. Yeah, that's a, that's a big hurdle that I've had for many, many years of, of not believing or feeling like I'm enough. And I am. I can be more, but I'm enough right now. That's beautiful. Well, Jesse, um, thank you so much. This has been amazing. For anyone um, who is interested, please go visit Depth Builder dot com is that right go visit learnings and missteps it's an amazing podcast go visit no bs with jen and jess please join the uh, emotional bungee jumpers if you're interested love and lean right that's the title of the book that it's an amazing book uh, applying 5s to relationships and jesse when does your second first book hit for the public the second first june 23rd we'll have the audio book the paper book uh and i'm working on a kindle version we'll see if that comes to life but june 23rd we're actually going to have a book release party here in san antonio texas baby so if you're in town come on by hit me up what what are you doing for the release party uh so there's a mike uh, a buddy of mine owns a, a bar mike sereno Dos Serenos over here in Southtown, and they're going to let me commandeer a portion of that space to have people come in and take selfies and get books and tell stories and uh, all the other stuff. The, the, the joint, it's a brewery. They got good food. They got a lot. Of, I, I don't drink, but oh, here's another. Oh, Spencer, I didn't even say this. So June 23rd is the launch party. Okay. It's also right. the reason I picked that date is because that is my or will be could be my seven year seven years what the day I celebrate seven years of sobriety. Oh my gosh, congratulations. Congratulations. That's freaking amazing. It's so awesome. I, it, there's so much there. Anyway, maybe that next time, but because June 23rd, seven years ago, was when I got arrested for DWI for the last time. And that sparked the series of events that got us to here now. And I what better that. way to celebrate and I release the that. book. Uh, but yeah, so we're going to be hanging out. I won't be drinking. They got plenty of food, coffee, and water, so I'll be fine. I love that. I love that. What time? What time is it for anyone that's interested? Yeah, 4.30 p.m. Central to 7 p.m. Uh, we'll be hanging out there, and and the only reason seven p.m. is because at at that point I intend to like pack up and leave and go do whatever. Um, uh, actually, do the reciprocal propulsion retreat. We can go hang out with a bunch of awesome people. Right. And people are free right. to stay the rest of the evening. I just don't intend to be there all night. That's the reason for the time block. I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. Are you considering live streaming it for any of us that can't be to San Antonio? <laughs> I've, I've thought about it. I've thought about it, Spencer. Like, for real, for real. Part of me is like, dude, nobody really cares, right? Nobody wants to see your garbage. 
Um, the other part of me is I feel like that would impose on somebody else to like do the managing of the live streaming. Uh, and that feels kind of yucky, but I, I'm still, I haven't decided. What do you think? You tell me, what do you think? I think you should do it. I, I, I tune in. I would tune in uh, personally. I'm sure there, there's a few, there's at least a few people I know that would tune in. So I, I think, uh, yeah. If I was there, I'd facilitate the freaking uh, streaming for you. I'd be, I'd be, I'd be your roadie in a heartbeat. <laughs> that is awesome. <laughs> well, I guess now I need to go visit it and make sure there's power and stuff. If, 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 if not, that that's fine. I just feel like I'm missing out. Just a little bit of FOMO from my side. <laughs> I, I got it. you, man. I stay, well, you know, Spencer, as always, dude, you've been, like I said, super inspirational and super, super supportive. And and you give me fuel, man. And I am grateful to you for being the man that you are in our industry and the man that you are in my life. I love you, brother. Thank you. I love you, too. Um, again, if anybody's interested in any of the many things that Jesse's doing, I think we should all focus way more on what you've been talking about, Jesse, and the, the impact that you're going to have on the industry is tremendous, bigger than you'll ever know. Thank you so much for all that you're doing. It's real work. It's, it's easy to work on the systems. It's easy to work on process. And that's one thing that I took away is um, you said, we go from managing things to managing people. And we start to manage people like things because we don't know how to manage people. And that right there hit me so hard. Um, and that's where you're focused. And I, I can't appreciate you more than I do. I love you. Thank you so much for what you're doing. It is the real work. So thank you. <laughs>